when do you think, uh, what do you think is going to happen the next couple of months? Uh, it's really challenging trying to identify um, when the market might bottom because this is just not a typical recession. We've got no historical data points to go back and say, oh, well, last time this happened, so there's a good probability it'll look like this this time. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's entirely unique. But uh, there are still some things to look, look, look to. Um, you know, we're not completely in the dark. I, I think you can kind of potentially um, not necessarily see all four corners of the room, but um, have a little bit of an idea as to where the exit might be. And so some of the things um, that I've been looking at in terms of what the outcome might be is, is looking at China, their response, uh, and how they are in terms of an economic perspective and also from a, uh, a social perspective at the moment. So looking at that first is that um, China obviously managed to um, stamp out the virus pretty quickly uh, with an effective lockdown. And uh, that lasted probably about two months to completely stamp out the virus. But what they've been very good at in China is um, testing, testing everyone, uh, in particular arrivals. So most of the COVID cases that are coming up now are people that are arriving back into China. Uh, and uh, everyone has to now quarantine regardless of whether you test positive or not. So that's a, that's a model for the rest of the world, particularly somewhere like New Zealand where we are an island. Uh, if we can eradicate the virus, then the only way it's going to come back in is from travels. Yeah, yeah. And I guess everybody's kind of just watching what's happening in the US and the UK. If they don't take drastic measures and, you know, how does it play out if New Zealand does extremely well and that you know Europe and, and the Americas don't. Yeah, so as, as we're seeing in China at the moment, is they had the a holiday weekend just been, uh, and effectively there's there's images of people um, getting back to normal life, uh, going to public places. Sure, they've got masks on and gloves on and stuff, but they are trying to return to normal life. So yeah. I think what that means for New Zealand is a uh, more likely a domestic economy for a period of time. Uh, and there will be industries that are affected, such as tourism uh, and, and travel, but other businesses should be able to start to return to normal um, more quickly. Yes, we are going to feel the effects of uh, a, a deeper slowdown from the US and the UK, but let's not forget that those particular countries are throwing a lot of stimulus at this. Uh, Japan... For example, yesterday announced a stimulus plan worth 20% of GDP. Uh, I mean, that's just unheard of. Huge, yeah. Yeah. So anticipating that some industries will recover a lot faster than others and, and yeah. industries like tourism, you know, they'll rebuild and they might be quite different and it might take 6, 12, even 24 months to get back to where they were. You know, look at in New Zealand saying that they're going to shift focus domestically um, for lack of alternatives, yeah. but um, still positive about it. Um, yeah. You know, some countries might bounce back pretty quickly and some industries might be very good place. I guess, does this mean, you know, as a, as a stock picker, as a, as an asset allocator, you know, you, your ability to read what's about to happen might mean that it's it's a lot better to start picking individual companies to bet on um, rather than, you know. Yeah, I'd be less inclined to be buying into an index, uh, a passive index product at the moment than ever. Yeah. Um, for the simple reason is that there's lots of winners and losers. Uh, and you, you might have a situation where the market could be relatively flat, but in amongst that there are big winners and big losers. Yeah. Uh, in particular, at the moment, you've got businesses that are big beneficiaries uh, of COVID. So those people, or those com companies that can enhance uh, online experience or digital experience for businesses uh, and consumers are obviously doing really well. Uh, for, we've got a business uh, that we invest in in Germany, which is an online pharmacy. Um, and it's you know, obviously having a surge in demand at the moment because people, A, want to shop online and B, because they are after um, products like Panadol more than anything else. Less uh, 
there's people are not as price sensitive for things like that at the moment. Yeah. And then you look at another business, uh, you know, that, that it could be directly related or have, di- have direct effects in terms of, um, uh, well, I guess let's pick an airline, for example, um, from my personal perspective is that now would not be the time to invest in a business like an airline because we just don't know the shape of the recovery and we don't know how long it will take for those businesses to return to normal. Uh, so, but at some point they will provide great opportunities because we, 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 there's always going to be an airline. Uh, there's always going to be a retail shop of some description, but you just need to be very careful about when you buy those businesses because many of them will not survive. Yeah. And I suppose there'll be a lot of people that are waiting to hear, for example, you know, how big is the subsidy or stimulus for a company like Air New Zealand? And then the stock might rally for a bit. And, but does that actually mean that they're out of the hole? You know, I think a lot of people are following the story rather than doing actual analysis and forward thinking. Yeah. I mean, I remember when Air New Zealand was 10 cents, uh, when it nearly collapsed uh, last time. So um, it had to be bailed out by the government back then. So, uh, yeah, I'm very wary of those uh, situations. I mean, um, Carnival Cruise Lines was raising some money last week again. Yeah. No, I wouldn't be investing in a cruise ship operator at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny, early on there was some market uh, commentators saying this is a great opportunity to buy. And within a couple of di- days they were retracting that and saying, actually, you know, I made a mistake. <laughs> Mm. Um, yeah but, you know it's always about capital preservation as much as it's about capital growth at times like this yeah yeah if you're there at the end then um you're better off and and that's i was gonna hint on that because um have you read the billion dollar bonfire book no i haven't no uh, so it's about so it's it's by chris lee um and and don't let the the author detract you so a lot of people have uh, some feelings about um, about that situation, but South Canterbury finance obviously costs the taxpayer and a lot of investors, you know, a huge chunk of their money. Mum and dad, uh, investors lost their shirts. And, you know, even my Nana, she's in her eighties. When I mentioned South Canterbury finance, you know, it's not a nice feeling. And I've been talking to a lot of business owners in their sort of seventies at the moment and South Canterbury finance and those blue chip companies, definitely entangled a whole generation of people that lost money. And I guess my, my question, my point is around that capital preservation, you know, what, what is the next potential South Canterbury finance, the blue chip? What do you envisage might be that, that next phenomenon that hits New Zealand really hard? Um, Probably my biggest fear, I suppose at the moment for Kiwi specifically would be commercial property. Yeah. Um, because what we are learning throughout this process is that um, coming out of it, the uh, how businesses operate will be different. So um, I don't know how you found it, but our fa- companies found it relatively easy to operate remotely. Yeah, yeah. And many of the team are coming and saying to me, hey, actually, can we work from home two days a week? Because this is really good. Yeah. And so if everyone gets used to working from home, then you don't need as big an office space. That's one. Uh, and the second one is that uh, there will probably be a number of hospitality businesses that go out of business. For sure. And, in which case, the landlords won't be getting any rent at all. And they will be putting pressure on um, those commercial property landlords. There's a lot of syndicated commercial property funds that... Um you know, less experienced investors, um, smaller investors, the people that probably can't afford to lose that money. And, uh, unfortunately they might get burned. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's probably quite a few syndicates out there. Uh, and it will depend on what the gearing levels are as to how they can survive, but it's definitely going to be changing for commercial property. So the, 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 the buzzword for the last week or so has been unprecedented. So I guess that um, nobody, 
no, no normal person has predicted such a dramatic effect across the whole world in a pandemic fashion on the markets. You know, how, how has what has unfolded affected your investment, the tactics and the philosophies? You know, you try to go back to your philosophies when things like this happen, but tactically yeah. you must have shifted the way that you guys are talking internally. Yeah, so um, typically when we think about what's going to cause a market downturn, we start to see those things develop in an economy or stress develop over a period of time. Yeah. Uh, whereas up until about the 20th of February, the market didn't believe that COVID was going to affect the world uh, in the way that it has. But I think it's, it's more about the cure than the disease, which is actually the problem. Yeah. Uh, so it's how we responded in terms of locking everyone down rather than um, uh, the, the actual virus itself. Um, obviously, from a humanitarian perspective, uh, is the right thing to do to um, prevent uh, a higher death rate. But economically, it's been um, catastrophic. And yeah. it's just those things, you, you know, I don't think we ever once discussed a pandemic as a potential risk yeah. uh, because it was just, it's just a black swan event, really. Yeah, and it seems so obvious after the fact. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but what we did do is pretty quickly adapted uh, to the environment. I think when it came out in China, uh, I wrote an investment strategy for the team with three options which yeah. we had ready to go on about the 2nd of February. Uh, and that was basically that it was contained to China was option one, option two was it spread, and then option three was a, a pandemic. Uh, and what I didn't know at that time is that the world would shut itself down, uh, yeah. which kind of would have been option four, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, we, we started to adapt um, the portfolios almost immediately in terms of, you know, we had some stocks in there. We had a stock that was running uh, outdoor events in Europe. Yeah. Uh, and ticket sales for that. So we had to just get rid of it, really, immediately. Yeah. Yeah, and, and reallocate to businesses that were survivors. And so did you have, you know, say January 1st, have a lot more of a global spread than you do now? Have you Have you brought things back closer to home or have you found – other international homes for the money for now? Um, it's probably more likely that we've found more international homes because we're able to access businesses that are more, um, more direct beneficiaries. You know, I gave that example of the online shopping, yeah. sorry, online pharmacy. Uh, we've also invested in HelloFresh, uh, meal kit delivery, and that's another gym based company. Uh, and we've got more of a skew to um, digital businesses. So we've increased our exposure to Microsoft. Um, so things like that. And we're just New Zealand and Australia to a certain extent, you know, it's, it's uh, retail, sorry, it's, you know, electricity retailers, it's um, yeah. banks, insurance companies and things. We don't have, it's, it's a broad range of investment opportunities here. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So, I mean, how do you how do you guys think about the small cap versus large cap? Is it a bit of a mix? You prefer to invest in things that other people don't have time or patience or access to, or well, you definitely need to the more, top. <laughs> you'll get more leverage to the upside with small caps, particularly coming out of a crisis. Um, that's what I experienced after the GFC in terms of the returns I achieved back then. Um, it's just the simple maths of it. It's, it's harder for Microsoft to double than it is for a business worth 50 million. It's yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. So um, the large caps will offer you a more defensive approach to your portfolio, but in terms of getting the, the upswing, uh, which everyone wants to capture um, it's, small caps, and even private businesses is where, where you'll get that. Of course, the risks are greater. Um, yeah. And so how do you, 
Do you follow, um, have you read any Toby Carlyle books that deep value or um, the acquirers multiple? Yeah, I mean, deep guys- value, it's interesting because I remember in the GFC and, and looking at businesses that at that stage might have been on a PE of five and thinking, oh, this is cheap <laughs> and watching it go to a PE of two. Yeah. You know, so um, value is, is relative. Uh, what's more important is about growth. Is the business able to grow uh, their top line? Because if someone looks at a business and says, well, I see no top line growth. I see pressure on their balance sheet. Uh, I see pressure on margins. Then the valuation just keeps contracting. Uh, it's the it's the point where, so you're either finding a business that, that's growing, in which case multiples not so relevant, yeah. um, or you find the business that is cheap but is at the cyclical upswing turn. Yeah, put a yep. momentum in there. Uh, yeah, rather than just cheap for the sake of being cheap. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you do you guys try and get in front of any M and A stuff? You know, arbitrage is this um, you know beautiful concept that everybody wishes they were privy to, but usually you know private investors don't have the bandwidth to be able to investigate things like that. Do you guys um, see much in that space? So what we have been taking advantage of uh, in the last couple of um, the last week really is where we've seen it is capital raising. So yeah, uh, New Zealand, we've had Kathmandu, we've had Auckland Airport, uh, but in Australia and in Europe, there's been a lot as well that we've participated in. Uh, Flight Centre, Webjet, um, Reese Plumbing, just to name a few. So there's, there's a lot going on. Uh, and often these capital raisings occurring at a 50% discount to the last traded price. So uh, yeah. um, it's, it's well worth participating if you can. Yeah, yeah. It's the kind of thing like I know all of those businesses, but I don't hear about, um, you know, Reese Plumbing, for example. I'm never going to hear about cap raise for that unless I'm on the right newsletter or work yeah. with the right investment partner, you know? So, yes, yeah, so it's, it, it's really hard for private investors at the moment to take advantage of those kind of things. It's almost exclusively will go to uh, institutional investors. Yeah, yeah. And, and fair enough, because you you probably get stuff done, uh, whereas you know, mum and dad investor will sit on it. Yeah, well, they, they need decisions within hours. Yeah. You're going to participate. Here's the price. Take it or leave it. Yeah. I saw the, the Auckland Airport one the other day. I saw an email at like four o'clock in the afternoon and they said we need answers by five o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh-huh. By all accounts, it looks like they were successful. Yeah. Um, most of them that we've participated in, there's been quite a bit of demand for it. Yeah. Because uh, the businesses are raising enough money to see them through, uh, you know, worst case scenarios. So it's mm-hmm. kind of fixed their potential problem. And so what, 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 um, what blogs and subscriptions and information sources do you feel that, you know, everyday investors should be looking at? What, what do you guys turn to? My probably number one source is probably Bloomberg. Yeah. Uh, so I just run, the, not actually a term, we've got a terminal in the office, but I just run uh, this, the Bloomberg app. Yeah. Um, through my phone. Then, uh, in terms of other news, uh, I just get sent stuff. And if it's interesting, I read it. And if it's not interesting, I don't read it. Yeah. Uh, or if there's something I hear about, you know, for example, um, I might get a morning note from ANZ Foreign Exchange uh, dealing team. Uh, and that's what alerted me to the Japan stimulus package. So I, I read that quick one liner and then I'll go and do some, I'll just Google it and just see what the package actually is. Yeah. 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 I'm sure you signed up to a lot of newsletters and maybe, yeah. you know, every 10 or 20 emails you get from that particular newsletter, you might just open it up and have a look. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so much in command box about this I actually have to be uh, a little bit discretionary as to what I'm going to read because I can't just sit here all day 
um, reading blogs and, and newsletters and things. Yeah. To try and, yeah. yeah. I've got 21,000 unread emails in my newsletter folder. I'm sure you're about the same. It's, it's a lot of minutes saved. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Choosing what to read. Like, um, I want one book that was recommended through Chris Lee's, uh, newsletter. I jumped on his newsletter list cause I, um, read that billion dollar bonfire book, which I really do recommend it. It is quite good. Is um, a, a book, Jaws of the Dragon, about how China is buying into New Zealand a lot. And it, it's quite a, you know, politically tinted book. But it is interesting, you know, from, from an outsider's perspective, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a money man, I'm not managing money or anything, and, you know, still relatively young, I'm not experienced and I haven't seen it all unfold. But the investment from from China and also from other countries, you know, I know the Germans and you know other European and companies that they're, they're coming into New Zealand and buying up a lot of businesses. Is that something that you guys, you know, you see businesses in New Zealand as potential takeover targets, or is it anything that you would think about very often? Um. We, we tend not to invest in the business because we think it'll be a takeover target because uh, that might not happen. We want to we want to be there because it's a good business and it's got the growth that we want. Yeah. Uh, if we get a takeover, that's a bonus. So, yeah, we're not particularly focused on, on, on takeovers uh, with reference to whether there are foreign buyers coming in to pick up New Zealand assets. I think it's always been the case. Yeah. Uh, Good New Zealand assets get bought by overseas overseas players, and it's as long as I've been investing, that's always happened. So I don't think that's any different now. Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that's a fair comment. You don't want to buy something on the um, the rumor that it's about to get bought out, then get stuck with it when it doesn't. Yeah. And, and what about um, on the accounting side of things? Are you guys when you're looking at companies to invest in? You know, how how deep is the analysis of of the books? Is there an element of trust? If the I don't know how it works. Are the accounts that are presented are they audited or you know what's the deal there? I'm sure there's a lot of fraud that's yet to be discovered. Yeah, look, over the years um, we've been caught in one or two things where companies have been fraudulent, but by and large uh, that doesn't occur uh, in the listed space. So, um, you know, yeah, companies will be audited. Um, but if we smell something, then we will get out. Yeah. 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 Uh, and one of the things you can look at is whether the, the, the cash flow situation of a business, because often where there's problems from an accounting perspective is the cash flow won't really be marrying up to the, um, uh, the revenue. So if you're not getting the cash flow received, then there's a problem. Yeah, I was listening to a, a podcast about a fraud case. Um, it was patisserie. It was it was like a cake and coffee um, company. Patisserie, yeah, yeah, and yeah. the CFO was I met the management team of that actually. Yeah, the CFO, unbeknownst to the chairman had taken out 10 mil from HSBC, supposedly, it's still going through the courts and and unrecorded it uh, on the balance sheet. So there was heaps of cash flow and there was top line revenue, but the margins were not real. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it does happen. Uh, um, yeah, uh, and, and the information often comes out in a in a um, uh, in a process sort of quite slowly. Um, some some people seem to find out before others. Yeah, uh, yeah, but it's it happens. You do your best to avoid it um, where you can, and you you tend to learn from the mistakes. And what about following other investors? Do you guys you guys place money with other um, fund managers or, you know, it was again, listening to Toby Carlisle's, uh, 
podcast and he was saying that his screens were telling him to buy Berkshire. So he did. And, you know, it's, it's a funny world where you got to give your money to Warren to manage when, even when you're a fund manager, you know, I got no issues with that, but. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I think Buffett now is that, um, it'll be interesting to see what he buys because he's got that large cash pile. There's bound to be a distressed asset. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if he's looking at something like Boeing. He, he tends to buy things which are, uh, out of favor. Uh, yeah. you know, he bought railroads, um, he gave money to Goldman Sachs and the GFC. So That's a good deal. Yeah. Yeah. He'll, I'm sure he'll manage to do some kind of bailout. Um, yeah. someone like Boeing or, or one of the airlines over there. Um, yeah, so it's always good to uh, keep an eye on what Berkshire's up to. But Buffett, he always, he sends the same message regardless, I think, is that, you know, uh, invest for the long term, you know, buy on this blood on the streets. Um, and his portfolio is probably relatively stable. But from from our perspective, we wouldn't necessarily be looking to, to copy what he does. Um, and we do look at other managers as to what they're up to, how they're performing. We read competitors' newsletters to see what they've been buying. Yeah. Um, just more out of interest to see what's going on and to compare our performance in the last, in the month of March to see how everyone else got on. Yeah. yeah. So well, I guess you'd be telling your clients that not to focus too much about the quarter that's gone or the quarter that's coming and you know, same story, focus on the 10 year plan and, Trust us. Yeah, I mean, if, if you were willing to add money to your investment portfolio three months ago, then you should definitely be willing to add to your portfolio now because everything's cheaper than it was. Yeah. Uh, and unless you're retiring in six or 12 months' time, then whatever you're adding to your portfolio now will look a lot better in five, 10 years' time. Yeah, and I suppose that you guys have got dividend um, portfolios anyway that if people need money then you're setting it up that way yeah yeah if people need an income portfolio then they can set that up although uh deriving an income at the moment is harder than it's previously ever been because bond yields are so low uh that the return expectations for those conservative portfolios is much lower yeah yeah and and what sort of clients are you looking for um like i, I know you guys have well, what, why don't you tell us a little bit more about the difference between what you're looking for with the Pythons and, and Juno? Yes, we've got essentially three types of operations. Uh, we've got uh, financial advice, which comes under our wealth team. Yeah. Uh, and that's clients with over half a million who want financial advice. Then uh, we've got Pythons, the investment manager. And that's clients who would come to us who don't want advice and want to invest directly. Yeah. Um, and we've got choices from Australasia to global to, to UK to conservative funds, et cetera. And with a focus on small cap. And then we also have a KiwiSaver scheme under the Juno brand. Uh, and that operates as a low cost active manager. Uh, and pleasing to say that we are ranked number one in, for our growth fund and number two for our balance fund over yeah. uh, the last five months. So pretty happy about that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's encouraging not so much the results, but the fact that you guys have started relatively recently and you're able to get things up and running because you already got the infrastructure. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you've been going, um, 20, 20 years, I guess. How long have you been officially as Pi funds? Uh, 2007. So I was just 13 years as Pi. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so um, Timmy was messaging me saying, if my investment is in a troubled asset class, i.e. airlines or commercial property, should I bail out or wait? I guess that's a question on the tip of everybody's tongue right now is. Yeah. Well, I think. It depends with you. It's already in the price. 
right? So uh, if it's already in the price, then there's no point selling. Yeah. If it's not in the price, uh, then you should be exiting. Yeah. So uh, because if 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 the future worst case scenario is already discounted, then you go well. well there's no point selling. Um, you know. Whereas if if you think, for example, I don't know, pick an airline, uh, Qantas. Uh, I haven't actually looked at their share price, but if you think the business won't survive without significant recapitalization or coming out different, then you'd say, well, why should I hold it at this particular point? Commercial property, a little bit different because I don't think there'll be many transactions happening at the moment. Yeah. 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 Transactions, you know, I think it's, it's fair to say property transactions, doesn't matter what it is, will slow down simply. Mm. You know, if, if for nothing else, except for business confidence, you know, I saw Westpac's uh, survey last week and they had a record low for business confidence and this week it's even worse. And I, now potentially next week it's even worse. And when you're adding weeks and weeks and weeks of worst case scenarios with business confidence in New Zealand, there's unlikely to be many private property transactions or, you know, business related ones. Yeah, the interesting thing about property is it moves in a slightly different cycle to the equity market. So stocks bottom earlier than property. Yeah. Uh, I remember buying property myself and the market was still depressed in 2010. Uh, you know, like a good year after stocks had bottomed. Yeah. Um, simply because the transactions are just happen at a slower rate. Uh, it takes banks a while to adjust their lending standards and let the credit flow again. Yeah. So while stocks can be off to the races, banks will still be very tentative in who they lend to. So if it's hard to get credit, it's hard for the property market to rebound. And I, I would imagine that property is a, quite a bit more emotional, uh, an emotional asset, you know, for family homes and business mm. workplaces and, um, you know, whether you own, you know, Berkshire or e New Zealand or Tesla or whatever, it's kind of like, you know, just buy and sell, you know, based on your thoughts of the day, it's not as emotional. So you can do it a bit quicker. Yeah. Yep. And what about, um, there's a, there's a lot of talk about inflation, deflation, stagflation, you know, there's a lot of chat about, you know, you print this much money, something's going to happen. What are, what are your guys' thoughts on on what what to own if any one of those scenarios unfolds? Some of our funds have got exposure to gold. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, I think that's reasonable to have some portfolio exposure to gold at the moment. We do that through um, Australian junior gold miners because they've got the most leverage if gold price continues to go up. Yeah. Uh, I think that if we weren't doing any money printing, we would have deflation big time. Uh, so if you look at QE and everything else we did in the last crisis, it created no inflation despite all the fears. So I think all we're doing is filling a hole at the moment. Uh, and then we'll have to see what happens in a year or two once we've filled the hole in, whether they still keep printing money. Yeah, it kind of feels like treading water at the moment. Um, yeah. If you go back and read some of Sir Bob Jones' property investment books, it's quite interesting through the 70s especially, you know, it was such a high inflation rate. Obviously, interest rates were high as well, but, you know, my interpretation of his portfolio growing such, in a such, like just a massive upswing, obviously he's a smart guy, but, the value of the properties that he was buying were just growing at such a huge clip because of inflation. And then when the rates eventually came down, you know, all this capital gain on top of the inflationary growth, it was just such a good, good thing for him. And you know, the, the top level thinking, if there is going to be a lot of inflation is uh, I should leverage up now and buy lots of property. That's one, one scenario. Now, how do you, and then there's a lot of people thinking, do I leverage off my property to buy shares? 
you know, <laughs> obviously seek individual financial advice, but you now what are your, what are your feelings about that? Uh, I would not be leveraging up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I know that, that money is cheap, uh, but just le leverage provides additional stress. Yeah. And I don't think you want additional stress at the moment. If you've got cash on the sidelines, sure, deploy that. But um, adding leverage at, a, at this particular time um, would, would be, in my opinion, unwise. Yeah, no, that's kind of what I hoped you would say. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, look, uh, I do appreciate your time, Mike. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add or share or point people in a certain direction to? Uh, look, I think the only kind of final message is, is to take away is, you know, um, a bit of hope really, I guess, is that I know it's, it's a devastating shock to the economy and to all investors, whether they be in property or shares. But these things have happened before in different, different, they've come in different ways, uh, but ultimately the, the outcome is the same, which is uh, everyone's poorer today than they were six weeks ago. Uh, but we come out the other side. Um, hopefully New Zealand will be out of lockdown pretty soon and we can start to rebuild. So that's, that's my message is that, and then once we get into that phase, that's when you as an investor look for your opportunities. And, and lastly, to, I guess to just be patient is that, um, opportunities will come all throughout the rest of, ne of this year. So don't feel like you have to rush in. Yeah. As tempting as it is. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> all right. I uh, appreciate it, Mike. Um, I'll, I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks. Right. Cheers. Cheers. You want me to sign?